Okay. Uh, Recording in progress. Go ahead. All right, hi, um, my name is John Nelson and today I'll be presenting on um, uh, how to use D-Wave's quantum annealing hardware to uh, perform high quality GIF sampling. Um, and this is work with uh, Mark Vifrey, Andre Lokov, uh, Tamim Albash, and Carlton Coffrin. Uh, let's see. Okay, so a brief um, introduction. Uh, our hope is to use D-Wave to uh, find ground states of classical icing models. And um, a reminder of uh, this icing model is basically it's a sum of these uh, terms where we have a variable for these um, spins that can take the value plus one or minus one. And um, there, so we have these coupling terms and then we have these bias terms. Um, and so it biases each spin to either uh, up or down. Um, and to uh, find these ground states, uh, what we do is we start in the ground state of a Hamiltonian that's uh, easy to prepare. Um, and then we interpolate between this Hamiltonian and the icing Hamiltonian that we um, want to, to find the ground state of. Um, and if we kneel slow enough, then we hope to stay in this ground state um, and eventually find uh, the, the ground state of this ladder Hamiltonian. And so in reality, um, we don't actually find the ground state every time, but because um, we only have so much time to perform this annealing, uh, there's some thermal excitation. So um, we uh, produce some higher energy states and uh, also air. So in general, we end up with the distribution over low energy states of this icing model. Um, and so what type of distribution is this? Um, we'd like to say that it's uh, a Gibbs-like or Gibbs distribution. Um, and that would be really nice because um, there's lots of practical applications for Gibbs sampling in general. Um, it uh, has applications for uh, simulating physics and uh, sampling from the uh, thermal states of uh, systems with finite temperature. And um, it's also a uh, subroutine in many machine learning algorithms. Um, and so a reminder of this Gibbs distribution, basically uh, the probability mass of each state depends on its energy and uh, the lower energy states are weighted higher um, and the mass decays exponentially with uh, higher energy. Um, there's also this beta term um, and the, uh, this is like uh, the inverse of the temperature. Um, so if you have zero temperature, then uh, beta is infinite and basically you sample uniformly from the ground states. Um, but uh, there are some challenges that have been observed in previous work. So one is that it's been observed that D-Wave does not actually sample uniformly from states with the same energy. So for instance, uh, it doesn't sample uniformly from uh, the ground states um, and at least under certain conditions. Um, and this is often explained by a freeze out argument, um, which says that, uh, which postulates that at some point in the anneal, it gets stuck and doesn't actually finish the anneal. And so there's some residual transverse field. Uh, so that's like these uh, poly X terms. Um, and that remains uh, after the anneal and this introduces biases, so it biases to some ground states over others. Um, and so clearly this is not uh, like very Gibbs-like, but um, th there's another source of error and that's if you scale down the interaction strength. So the interaction strength here, I'm referring to the magnitude of these J and H values. Um, and so we always take the J and H values, the magnitude to be constant throughout the entire uh, Hamiltonian, but uh, what changes is the, the sign. So it can take uh, uh, positive or negative sign. But uh, yeah, we keep the, the these magnitudes uh, constant and refer to that as interaction strength. So when that is small, um, it's been shown that actually it does not suffer from this issue of uh, non-uniform sampling from states with the same energy and these, these uh, residual transverse field, but it does suffer from noise. Um, and so this noise can make the distribution uh, 
significantly different from the original uh, distribution that we want to sample from. And uh, that was observed by my co-authors a couple years ago. Um, and so these two sources of air have inspired our work. And uh, in our work, we argue that both sources of distortion can be avoided by carefully tuning the interaction strength. Um, and that comes from the intuition that this residual transverse field it dominates when there's large interaction strength and the flux noise dominates when the interaction strength is low. Um, and there is a sweet spot in between. And so this number is specific to the D-wave machine, but around 0.2 to 0.4, whereas the full range is between zero and one. Um, and in this regime, uh, we observed that uh, both of these um, sources of distortion are significantly mitigated. Um, and we then uh, do some like extensive experiments to evaluate uh, how well we can sample, do give sampling for randomly generated icing model instances. Um, and then we also show how you can tune the temperature of the Gibbs distribution you want to sample from uh, by tuning parameters in D-Wave. Um, so first um, I want to present some evidence for this intuition of uh, why we believe uh, of these two different sources of air and the, their, um, their, uh, how they dominate in either the small interaction strength regime or the large interaction strength regime. Um, and so to do this, uh, I'll present this like uh, toy model and then um, the main results for our, uh, will be after. Um, but okay, so the, for this toy model, we basically have a three spin system where spins one and two are coupled and spins two and three are coupled. Uh, then we just collect many samples uh, from this running the, this quantum annealing process on D-Wave and getting the ground state, which is uh, these uh, some spin configurations. Um, and then using these spin statistics, uh, we reconstruct each term, each coupling term and this will be the, a coupling term between one, two, two, three, and also one, three, which is not present in the original Hamiltonian. Um, and we uh, use a Hamiltonian learning algorithm that my co-authors developed. Um, and then finally, we'll uh, re redo this experiment, but instead of sampling from D-Wave, we'll sample from uh, this, uh, a model of the uh, Hamiltonian. And this model includes the transverse field term and a noise term. Um, and then we'll compare how well the model agrees with the actual data. And um, the things to note is that the transverse field uh, depends on the interaction strength, so it scales with it. So it gets much worse when the interaction strength gets uh, better, so that, that captures this idea that uh, I mentioned earlier. And uh, the, the flux noise does not scale with interaction strength, and it's actually we take the ADA parameter to be quite small. Um, so it's very insignificant when J, uh, with, when J gets large. And so then we sample from this like noise average thermal Gibbs state and uh, do the same Hamiltonian uh, reconstruction. So um, here is the data and we see like very good agreement. Um, and the things to note is that the, the main source of distortion or is this, uh, this coupling between one and three is not actually present in the um, original Hamiltonian. And so that, that's uh, what is really um, making uh, our output statistics very non, uh, not match our, our desired Gibbs distribution. And you can see this uh, like spurious uh, coupling uh, become much uh, greater with the greater interaction strength. Um, and also it's hard to see, but it's also becomes negative when you go below 0.25, but it's around zero around this uh, 0.25 regime. Um, and so we kind of designate that as our sweet spot. Um, and also uh, we like just by experimenting with this model, we can see that the, the, the main feature of the noise is this negative, uh, uh, spurious coupling value for low J and uh, this distortion here can be attributed to this transverse field term that scales with J. Um, okay, so now um, on to the main experiments is uh, we 
uh, a bunch of 16 spin icing models with various ground state degeneracies. Um, for each of these, uh, we redo the experiment at various uh, interaction strengths. So remember we keep J and H the magnitude to be constant for each of the models and we take it, uh, or I guess not zero, but slightly above zero and up to one. Um, and then uh, we also redo the experiment for di different annealing times. And uh, for each of these configurations, we take uh, about a million samples from D-Wave. Um, and then we compare the output distribution to Gibbs distribution. And we do this by uh, classically computing the exact Gibbs distribution. And we just use this, we, or we do this by brute force because we only have 16 spins. So we tried to take as big of a model as we can that can still be relatively easily uh, simulated classically by brute force. Um, and then uh, we compute the total variation between the exact Gibbs distribution and uh, the D-wave distribution. And so this total variation metric is just the absolute uh, value of the difference between the uh, probabilities at, for each uh, uh, output at spin configuration. Um, so, um, here is an example of one of, uh, these randomly generated, uh, IC models, and we show all the different annealing times. And basically the punchline is that, uh, alpha in is like our interaction strength. And so for low alpha in, uh, we, we see like a big divergence from the Gibbs distribution of the D wave statistics for large alpha in, we see something similar, but as long as uh, alpha in is between this sweet spot that agrees with our original pre-spin uh, toy model exper experiment. Um, then the, the uh, distribution matches the uh, Gibbs distribution very well. And so we kind of designate 5% as this accuracy uh, threshold. And uh, it's also interesting that varying the annealing time doesn't really affect uh, where this sweet spot regime is. Um, and so here are some more results. Uh, this is for various uh, different uh, randomly generated instances. And by random, I just mean we take the, uh, we, we include every coupling term in the D-Wave architecture and we just randomly choose positive or negative. Um, and uh, the left terms in, don't include this uh, field bias and the right terms include this like single spin uh, field bias. Um, and we see that consistently uh, we're getting uh, very good agreement with the Gibbs distribution for this regime between uh, 0.2 and 0.4. Um, and it's also important to be able to tune the temperature of the Gibbs distribution that we're sampling from. And we can do this by uh, one, we can vary our interaction strength between 0.2 and 0.4. So, it is a kind of a narrow regime that we're trying to hit, but it's not, you know, there is some room to vary. Uh, and then we also can vary in the annealing time and that affects uh, the temperature that you're sampling from. And um, by varying these together, you can get a, a pretty uh, consistent um, uh, range of um, temperatures. So, in conclusion, um, we analyzed major sources of errors uh, when trying to perform give sampling on quantum annealing hardware. Um, and ident we identified that uh, there, there's a specific scaling regime uh, that you can use to um, really mitigate these errors. So this is, we showed it for give sampling, but like in general, um, these errors are not desirable noise and uh, having this residual transverse field. So it kind of serves as a general uh, piece of advice to when, if you're going to use these quantum healing hardware uh, devices um, to not push your uh, interaction strength all the way to one or max it out, but really you want it to be in this middle, uh, middle ground area. Um, and then we showed that by uh, specifically tuning the energy scale for Hamiltonians, we can um, improve the Gibbs sampling performance. And we also show that uh, it's possible to um, tune the specific temperature that you're sampling from. All right, thank you. And I'll take any questions.
questions? How did you? Yes. How did you fix the temperature? Um, as in, how did we? Uh, oh, sorry. Um, like, how do we compute the temperature, or how do how do we adjust it? Yeah, the by D wave machine with the exact Gibbs distribution. Okay, yeah, I, I can just explain that a little more in depth. I, I did brush over that part. Um, so one, just, uh, we, we expect the, um, like scaling the, basically the, the energy scale of um, the, the input problems that is uh, effectively changing the temperature of the system. But um, the, s the same goes with the annealing time. So uh, longer annealing times uh, basically relates to um, more often finding the ground state, which is essentially similar to having like lower temperature in the system. Um, but there's also this question that I glossed over of uh, how do we actually know what is this temperature that we're sampling from? Um, and so that's calculated by uh, so when I say we classically compute the exact Gibbs distribution using brute force, we actually calculate this Gibbs distribution for many different uh, temperatures, um, this classical Gibbs distribution. And then we see which uh, Gibbs distribution matches best with D-Wave. So we're basically implicitly inferring what, the, through this process, we're inferring what the, this effective temperature is of D-Wave. Um, and so we have to do that step as well to actually see what is the temperature we're sampling from. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think there's a question in the chat. Maybe you could read that and answer the question. Uh, so it says, does this tuning affect both energies and uniformity of samples, both the Gibbs distribution of energies and the uniform distribution of samples at uh, fixed energy. Um, yeah, so um, I guess uh, both. Um, so sampling from the Gibbs distribution is actually uh, a large part of getting it right is being able to sample uniformly from low energy states. Um, because all the probability mass is on the low energy states and it decays exponentially after that. So you really have to get those right. And so if you, especially if you mess up like the ground state and you don't sample uniformly, then that's like gonna be the dominant source of uh, error between your distribution and the Gibbs distribution. So um, yeah, I would say that one of the main, uh, uh, like tuning this um, energy scale is uh, mainly to kind of fix this, to, to try to make make it so that um, these these low energy states are being sampled uniformly. So um, I guess my answer is yes to that. Any other questions? Questions online? Okay, I have a question. Do um, you think your technique is scalable? I mean, I see that uh, the temperature I can sample from depends on the annealing time. So I guess if I increase the system size, I probably mm -hmm. need to increase as well the annealing time. So maybe there will be system size where things might break down. Um, yeah, that's definitely um, something that uh, I guess we'd like to experimentally test um, how it scales. It's definitely a future direction of this work. Um, I think in general, 
since we uh, show from these very small systems, like these three spin systems, the presence of these distortions when you increase the interaction strength. So, uh, and, and we see that it still persists when you get from go from three spins to 16 spins. I think that in general, um, it's not a good idea to uh, really blast up the interaction strength um, because I, I, it, it does really seem like there, there is something uh, going on where uh, that really uh, exacerbates the, um, the effect of this uh, freeze out or the, this residual transverse field that uh, stays there. Um, and I th so I think like um, in general, yeah, I, I think it would scale in the sense that I think always uh, having too low of interaction strength makes you susceptible to noise and too high um, makes this uh, residual transverse field issue worse. Um, and so I think that regime is always going to stay consistent. How good of a give sampler it is for uh, bigger systems, I think that remains to be known. I think uh, most likely it, the performance would uh, degrade as you get uh, larger system sizes. But the, the general takeaway message, I think, would stay consistent in terms of this uh, uh, trying to operate within this sweet spot regime. Thanks. Well, if there's no other question, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you.